Good morning. I am very honored to be moderating this panel, and I'm not going to waste time. We've just heard who is on it, and I will just tell you uh, the order in which we'll go, and then we're going to let her rip. So Perry Merlin, Merling will come first, followed by Wendy Carlin, uh, then John Smithen, and um, Dave Colander. No, I'm sorry, I left out Oscar Landerecci, who is coming after. <clears throat> he'll, be, he'll be right after Perry Merling. So, Perry. Good morning. Um, are my slides here? Good. Um, so I, just to set the scene, um, uh, many of you, uh, I hope all of you, were at that dinner speech by John Rustin Saul uh, two nights ago in which he talked about or he urged uh, a, a moment where economists would leave the church um, and set up their new economics departments and create a new economics for the future. Um, that sort of, that rang a bell with me, that's sort of what I've been trying to create, okay, inside INET and urging. Um, not so much quitting my day job, okay, but uh, creating a parallel economics department um, online, um, available for free uh, to the world uh, to try to uh, change economics. And you can see the title that I put up there, New Economic Teaching for New Economic Thinking. Um, for me, that's the part that I'm trying to emphasize, is using, new educate, new, using educational materials and so forth to create a new generation of economic thinkers um, that, can, that can change the profession, that can change the way we do things. So I think of this, uh, I, I often tell the, the, the young people, um, we're not gonna get much new economic thinking unless we get some new economic thinkers, and that's you. Um, but we need to create new economic thinkers, and that's what the educational challenge um, is. Now, I need to get a new slide here. Um, so I just want to tell you, we've been at this for a couple of years, um, and we have a number of things going on now, and it might look a little incoherent from the outside, so I want to ex explain a little bit the logic of it. Um, that first, uh, that first uh, bullet point there is a link to the, uh, our, our first effort, which was the curriculum committee that I headed the U.S. version and, and Lord Skidelsky headed the U.K. version, and we kind of did a, a bit of an overview of the state of play um, and, uh, and it was rather different in the UK and in the US. Uh, you can go to that, to that site and see our reports and, and so forth. Um, but it's certainly clear that in both the US, UK, and pretty much throughout the world, there's a monoculture. Okay. There's, there's a way that economics is taught, and it's, there's not a lot of diversity. Um, but it also seemed that, that there were the, the way that educational uh, that, that education is organized in different countries is, is quite different. Um, and so the way to influence change, okay, would be quite different. So after that, we kind of went separate ways. Um, you're gonna hear in a moment from, from Wendy Carlin, the, core, the Curriculum Open Access Resources and Economics Project, which is the most direct sort of follow-up from that uh, original curriculum effort um, because it's focused on undergraduates. For myself, I took uh, I took a message actually from David Colander here. He said, but who's gonna teach this new course? And I said, you know, that's a good, that's a good question, okay? So let's try to work on another angle here. Um, and so there are sort of two ways that I proceeded with that. One was by developing online courses um, that would become available so for so students to self-teach um, and, uh, and, for, and for professors who might be interested to use as, as teaching materials to add to their courses or to use instead of standard, standard textbooks. And the Young Scholars Initiative was the other bit, okay? Like, so, so creating the, the, the students who are interested in being the next generation of teachers and pay, paying attention to them and helping them. So I wanna tell you a little bit about the online effort uh, first. Um, the, uh, well, I'm gonna tell you about the MOOC that I made, Money and Banking. Let me just skip over that now. But we've also made, so this is an online course, Money and Banking, that currently has 60,000 people registered. We actually ran, ran it um, last fall. Um, and we're gonna run it again, I think, this summer. We also have another one that we created, Advanced Microeconomics. Um, you saw some of these things in the, opening, in the opening video of the whole conference, just flipping by, okay, you might have seen me, Sanjay Reddy, doing Advanced Micro. 
We're also creating another kind of educational product, which we call the mini courses. Um, and we now have three of them. And we just, just in the last couple of days, we filmed two more. Um, statistical learning, this we filmed in Hong Kong. Um, economics of information, that's a history of economics uh, course with Phil Morawski. Law and finance with Katerina Pistor. There were little clips from these three, too, also in that initial video you might have, you might have seen. Um, and, and then there's a, 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 a third kind of product that we're experimenting with, um, which we've just filmed um, with Michael Sandel. So what you saw last night, um, there's actually a six, a six edition kind of course about that uh, that, we, that, that we've created that will be, that will be coming out soon. Um, the Young Scholars Initiative, which some of you may have visited um, downstairs in the Imperial Room, um, they've also created their own sort of webinars and reading groups that they're running on, the, and we're supporting that um, with, uh, with advice about what to read and so forth, but mostly it's a free-running uh, organization. We're thinking about creating supplements, um, readers, textbooks, e-books, um, whatever. I'm hoping that we'll have some discussion, and, and if you want to come up afterwards and give me suggestions, we're trying to do new economic teaching to create new economic thinking. And that means thinking out, outside the box a little bit, I think, about the educational uh, enterprise. So here's just to show you, this is the MOOC that, that I made, that's me there, um, on Coursera. Uh, which we ran, uh, they filmed my course, just to t give you a sense of the, the, the difficulty of this that INET did. So they filmed every single lecture I gave um, live. Um, that's 24 lectures, 24 75 minute lectures. And then we edited them down and posted them here on Coursera in two parts. So there's two six week courses um, that you can take. And all the videos are up there, all the lecture notes are up there, quizzes, inline quizzes. Um, and the response to this course, I must tell you, just completely astounded me, um, and I astounded INET. Uh, it, it's, quite, it's quite remarkable, the amount of energy that, <coughs> that, when, that came out of this. We staffed it online with volunteer TAs, volunteer uh, community TAs, who were volunteers from the Young Scholars Initiative. Um, so it became a sort of community effort um, to even, even produce this course. Um, I taught it at the very same time at Columbia as a flipped classroom, so-called, um, and maybe if you're interested, we can, we can talk about that. I'm still refining all of this. This is definitely a pilot project and, and, and uh, work in motion. Um, but, uh, and it, it's a lot of work, but I do think it, it winds up having uh, quite a lot of impact, and I, can, uh, we're, I, I have a little report about it if you, if you want to see. I'm happy to give me your card, and I'll send it to you about that experience. Um, we're going to, so this, is, this was meant to be a pilot to inspire other people to produce MOOCs. It's a lot of work. Okay. Here's just some statistics about that, uh, about that course. I took a survey just to see who took it. 20% were undergraduates. I this is an undergraduate course at Columbia. 22% um, were graduate students or professors. 26% were from the private sector, which maybe you would expect given that it was a, a money and banking course. Um, public sector, hobbyists. Um, so it's a very different population, the online population, than the undergraduate student body. At least that was my experience. We're gonna, and it may be different for different courses. It probably will be different for different courses. Um, this is just some statistics. Here's another, um, I asked them, where are you physically located right now? Um, so where was their laptop when they were taking this course? 26% in the US or Canada, 26% in European Union, but there's significant representation, 6% from South America, 6% from non-EU Europe, 11% from India, 11% from Asia other than China, um, Africa, it, it was all over the world. Um, quite, quite a remarkable experience dealing with this group of students. And here, here's my last slide. So reflecting, uh, looking back to this adventure, starting with the curriculum committee three years ago and moving to the, to the present, um, we, education for what and for whom, um, it seemed to us that the educational enterprise seemed largely organized around the needs of professors and the, and the self-perpetuating priesthood of academic economics and was not maybe uh, thinking about uh, the role of economics in society and how can, we, how can we better align that, thinking of creating some useful economics um, uh, what do economists do? Uh, thinking about preparing people for government service, for private employment, and for undergraduate teaching, not just to perpetuate this, this uh, sort of academic research uh, scholastic uh, enterprise. Um, 
But the part that I've come, so that's what, where I was two years ago at Bretton Woods. This, the, the final bullet point is where I am today, thinking that, the, that, that creating this teaching enterprise that we're doing is really about creating a teaching and learning community. There's just a lot of energy out there, people wanting to figure out how the world works. Um, and, uh, and I feel like INET is there to help them figure out how the world works and interacting with them. It's not just a one-way one uh, 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 channel. Um, it's learning from them and them learning from us. Um, we, are, we are on a great journey, um, and I think we're just at the beginning. Um, and I, I look forward to hearing, um, you'll hear uh, just now, from other bits of things that we're, we're supporting. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, the slides please. Okay, good morning. Um, quick thanks to INET and CG for the invitation to speak about this. I'm the director of the School of Economics and Business of the University of Chile. I want to stress this because what I'm going to talk about is a case of curricular reform in economics, but in an economics and business school. And uh, just a little quick thing. If we're serious about reforming how economics is, is thought, we have to think about business schools, okay? So this, just, that's the majority of the, the market, by the way. So uh, that's a very important thing we have to bear in mind. Um, so I'm going to um, give you a little bit of the plot for the reform. First thing, anybody who's been around economics for a while knows that Chile is a emblematic, is perceived to be an emblematic case of very conservative economic policy application for a long time. It's not really that uh, as it looks, but, it, but it, that's the way it's perceived, and it's perceived internally as well, in that way. So uh, it's sort of the uh, poster boy for neoliberal economics for a long time. Uh, second thing, the school I, 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 I'm in charge of is a really important school. It uh, forms a significant amount of the leaders, both business and political leaders of our, of our country. So, it's a, it's a very relevant place politically. Uh, third, of course, we had the subprime mortgage crisis, which detonated uh, a crisis in economics and finance. Um, uh, fourth, we had the international wave of protests in 2011, and all this added up to, um, um, a, um, uh, together with a big crisis we have in the uh, public education system and in the university system in Chile, which I'm not gonna get into, but a big crisis. And all this added into a, a very, very, very explosive situation uh, in 2011. Just to give you an idea, this is the campus where we are. Uh, it's one of the campuses that the University of Chile has. And during 2011, almost every two or three weeks, we had protests at these uh, three points. Uh, so in the middle, you'll see that there's a red thing there, and that's, the, that's where the faculty is, uh, writing papers, okay? And so we would have meetings with some of our colleagues and talk about, let's say, a paper on Mincer equations or something like this, right? And, and the returns to education, and we would look down from the 16th floor and we would have battles going on uh, at, at these three points every two or three weeks. The union leadership, the student union leadership that run the whole protest uh, in Chile, which were enormous, uh, at one point we had half a million people in the streets, okay? Uh, uh, is just is within the campus. It's 100 meters away from my office. So this was a we're in the middle of this. Uh, um, I'll give you some images. These are these are this is what was going on in Chile. Okay, uh, really really big protest. Look at that. Uh, okay, and uh, just to give you a sense of, of how important this is, these are the photographs of four student leaders. Uh, as you can see, we have very cool student leaders. Okay, uh, some of you who have seen the press may recognize Camila Vallejo, who's in the corner up there, and she was, she was a superstar, okay? And the four of them were elected to Congress this year. So these protests were in 2011. They finished their degrees last year, and now they're Congress people, okay? And so this is, this is, just to give you a sense of how important these, these, these things were, this changed the political landscape in Chile dramatically, okay? Uh, very important things happened. And of course, being in the, having the economics and business school right in the middle of it, uh, made the students of our school start pressuring for economic curriculum and made it a big deal, uh, a, big, a big part of it. So the, 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 both the economics and business students were dissatisfied with the curriculum. This generated uh, a big, um, a lot of things. They, they, were, they were dissatisfied with the, 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 the lack of an ethics formation in the curriculum. 
they were dissatisfied with the way we were teaching human behavior, uh, the lack of other sciences to complement uh, to uh, complement uh, economics. You know, so lack of sociology, lack of psych like psychology. They were dissatisfied with the lack of a formation in social responsibility, in environmental responsibility, and in social entrepreneurship. They were very dissatisfied with a lot. Of, there was a, there was more stuff, but this is the, the the highlights. The economics majors were very, very dissatisfied with how we were treating income distribution. I mean, we measure income distribution all the time in Chile. We're one of the most unequal places in the world, uh, but we have no solution for it. So, I mean, you, you go and study to do that, and your professors tell you, yeah, you can look at a pretty picture about uh, uh, income distribution, but we don't know what to do about it. So, uh, that was very, th there, was a, there was a critical view of how we were teaching collective life in a sense of non-market, non-contractual collectives, how do they, they work. Um, um, there was a critical view of how we were treating politics and power. They were very suspicious that inside the method we had, there was an ideological bias, namely that the burden of proof was all, always on one side and not on the other, basically. And there was this thing with market failures, which uh, you know, they felt that the, you, you, you had to wait five years to be a graduate to treat market failures seriously, and they felt that, that was ridiculous, and of course it was. What this generated was that academics uh, started admitting their own dissatisfaction with what they teach because of the pressure of the, of the students, and some long-standing academics uh, that have been critical were able to voice their, 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 their views, and this generated the 2012 Comprehensive Curricular Reform. I was brought into office to actually execute this, this reform uh, because I had been a long-standing critic. Um, and just to give you an idea of the reform, and I'm, just, I'm not going to go into each one of these, but I'm just going to mention them, um, and I will see, I'll tell you why. We implemented experiments in flipped classroom, which uh, Perry was uh, talking about. We flipped the whole uh, economics uh, curriculum to, uh, in, in a way that now, so market failures, we don't talk of them as failures anymore. They're normalities. We have to stop talking about market failures. They're market normalities. It's the usual. It's the normal thing. Moreover, it's your job. If you're an economist or somebody in business, you have a job because there are market failures, okay? Otherwise, we wouldn't need you. Uh, so this is what we have to study, and market perfection, the Valrasian paradigm, is really an exceptional case which sometimes maybe comes true, okay? So this is the this course. It's, it's really hard to do this, but we did it. Um, we have compulsory social internships. We have social entrepreneurship uh, program. We change the community. We have a com communications program which teaches the students to do content, critical content analysis. We change the math focus uh, from calculus to, to statistics, from exercises to problem solving. We increase private internships. We increase the humanities, and we have a new ethics program. I'm not going to go into it, but I can argue why each of these things are really important for a new curriculum in economics or business. And, but, but my main message is this, econ curricular reform is not only about econ courses, and we would be very clumsy if we thought so. Uh, it's about a comprehensive look at the curriculum, uh, complete curriculum, because, um, um, well, everything you know, fits together in some way. But what about the teaching of actual economics, of actual economics courses? What, what, what specific problem did we find there? Well, um, the professors are the problem, we found. Professors are the problem. And why are professors the problem? Well, there's, uh, some of them think that there's nothing wrong with the old Valrasian uh, paradigm, and that's, uh, we know this, and this is, uh, this is an ongoing sort of discussion we, we're having. Uh, but others ignore advances made in economics in the last three decades, okay? So, you know, um, let's say the Greenwald-Stiglitz theorem that proves that the two uh, welfare theorems are false, basically, or don't really apply, has been around for a long time, okay? And we don't teach it at undergraduate level. We teach the two welfare theorems. So, uh, so it's not like, you know, you, there's this new stuff that we have to wait for. It's been around for many, many decades. Uh, Stiglitz has been around, he's, <laughs> he's around here, but he's been around for a long time, and we don't teach him. And, uh, so, and some people just ignore that fact and say, you know, we have to go, you know, we have to dismiss economics. Uh, and, uh, well, I, I think that there's a limit to that argument. Um, the solution, of course, is a mix. Uh, we have to update teaching advances uh, in economics. Uh, we also have to embrace radical new thinking and research. We have to do both things. And I think in a, a, a corner solution is not really the answer. Uh, but this has a problem. Um, this is hard work, okay? And one thing that you'll find when you, I mean, those of you who have been uh, heads of uh, schools at universities, like me, uh, you'll find that uh, they don't like hard work. Uh, professors don't like hard work, okay? And why don't they like hard work? Um, 
First, because there's an academic political economy that's going against anybody who wants to reform anything. Um, at teaching-oriented universities, uh, uh, professors have no time to do innovation, okay? They're doing six up to eight courses in some places. They have no time. They, they want the, the, the teaching uh, book that's already digested, the PowerPoint presentations they can download, everything, you know, ready for them, okay? And that's a reality. And we, have to, we have to face that reality. Uh, and uh, and uh, not seeing these people is like, uh, is like when the Democrats in, in the U.S., uh, ignored uh, Southern talk radio, okay? And then found out that half the country believes in, uh, in uh, creationism, okay? You can convince people in the elite of something, but you have to also work about the, the masses of people who are using this material. So a lot of teaching-oriented universities, universities have academics that have no time. At research-oriented universities, they have no incentive. They have to do papers. They have to write papers. They have no time for undergraduate teaching. Um, so that's a problem. Mine is a research-oriented university, and it's very hard for me to get the, 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 the professors to, it, to, to do innovation. It's very, very hard. Um, so that's the importance of, 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 the, of the core econ project. Wendy's going to talk more about it, which is about you know, prefabricating the materials for them, making it easy for them, you know, making it easy for them to get the materials and be able to teach it, to not have to invest so much time in it, and that's very important. Okay, so, and by the way, um, we're going to need to translate this thing. I've, I've, I've seen, and I've, I'm, I'm a big fan of INET, and I'm, I'm probably one of the guys that have seen all the videos, really. I have. Uh, and I've pushed them into my students. Uh, but, you know, some of them are just learning English, and this happens in many countries. If you want to get into the mass market of things, undergraduate level, uh, it's in the local languages. And uh, I think INET has to do a better job with that. You have to have subtitles and stuff, okay? A good model is a, a, a website called uh, Project Syndicate, which we all look at, okay? They translate into many languages. They have a big impact. And we're gonna have to translate the core econ if we wanna have the impact we, we, we want. Uh, the other thing why it's, it's hard to do this is because teaching has to have a narrative. Um, so if you remember, I argued as, uh, a while ago that we needed to combin combine updated teaching advances in economics and embrace radical new thinking and research. And to do this combination, to do this tension, to manage this tension, you need a teacher that builds a narrative, tells you why you have this combination or what particular combination you're going to manage. Why is it important to do it this way? And why you have to tolerate little things here and there? And um, so you, you, you have to answer questions like, why are we studying this? Why are we studying it this way? Uh, how is this related to the structure of meaning that sustained me as a student, a scholar, or a citizen? What's allowed and what's not allowed? You know, how is this relevant? How is it related to local issues and problems? Okay, and by the way, this is what professors are for. Otherwise, we would just need you know, online uh, courses or just books. Having a professor in front of you with his subjectivity, this is what it's for. It's for the narrative, right? Uh, it's for, it, it, that's what you're getting. Uh, and you're, we're not gonna get out of that. And um, so, the message, if you do this properly, is, and we've had some experiences in, in this, these courses that we've flipped this idea of market normalities or market uh, uh, failures, is if you do it properly, you actually get the students who come into the class very critical, they're very skeptical, they always feel that the professor is trying to cheat them out of some radical new ideas, okay? And then they find out that actually economics is interesting, it's useful and fun, uh, that they form part of an interesting debate that even, even what we call mainstream economics hasn't, hasn't have re resolved debates. There have been things around for 30 years and 40 years that are very useful and been ignored, and there are many open questions that they can, uh, they can uh, participate in solving. And the message is that doing this combination is actually an intellectual and emotional challenge which is worth taking. It's really hard, and it's nice, and it's interesting, and it's a good thing to do, to get yourself to be a, an economics academic or a teacher and get into this mess. Okay, so changing, just to uh, ending, so changing the economics and business curriculum requires, first of all, a comprehensive reform, okay? So how, we have to do what we do in econ courses, but also the rest of the curriculum, and that's important to understand. Second, uh, we have to change economic courses, and we have to recognize this sort of production function I see. You, there's the producing of new research and new economic thinking, and, uh, and also reviving and updating the neglected economic thinking. I think we have to, you know, it's always the new things are attractive, but there's these old things that have been there for quite a while, very, very important stuff, and it's been neglected, and sometimes for ideological reasons, okay? 
And then we have to do this is the hard part, simplifying and making accessible for responsible undergraduate teaching because this, here's the thing, some of the new stuff is really hard. I mean, Valrasian style economics, supply and demand is really simple, okay? The reason people don't teach Stiglitz at an undergraduate level is because you can do a Edgeworth box and explain the two, the two, the two, uh, the two welfare par uh, uh, theorems very easily. It's really hard to explain Greenwald and Stiglitz in an easy undergraduate way. So this job has to be done. And neoclassical economics did this job really well, really well, okay? And uh, that's, that's important. And then, uh, finally, we have to create a community of narrators, of narrators, of teachers, of new economics. They have to construct these narratives, uh, these complicated narratives, while you tolerate these, uh, these tensions. And, uh, of course, the INET is, is involved uh, funding a lot of the, the, the things up there, and that's very, very important, and I hope they do more of it. And it's it's really important uh, thing. Uh, for example, core econ, some of the things that Perry talked about are, are, are involved in simplifying and making accessible stuff. Uh, this, is very, this is very hard work, by the way. It's very hard work, and, and it has to be supported. And the other thing is, uh, so what are we doing about the, the, the community of narrators? Um, what are we doing there? Um, this is, uh, so some of the things you mentioned sounded like this, and, but I think that uh, maybe we need something like this, you know, teachers for new economic thinking. Something like this. We need meetings where people talk about how they teach stuff to an undergraduate, to a second year undergraduate. How do you teach that? In a business school, okay? A non-research oriented business school, which is the majority of people. Uh, otherwise, we're not gonna penetrate the, the mainstream, by the way. And uh, so I think, you know, maybe I need to do this. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Let me begin by relating this, this story from the chair of a leading university in, in Turkey who said, the students can handle any problem set we throw at them, but if I ask about the economy, their reasoning is no different from the wisdom of taxi drivers and sometimes a bit less well informed. So that's from the teachers and this is from the students. This is from a graduating student. Look, you can see she's successful. That's her graduation certificate there, Natalie Grisales. She said, before I chose economics, a professor mentioned to me that economics would give me a way to describe and predict human behavior through mathematical tools. That possibility seemed fantastic to me. However, after some semesters of study, I had many of those mathematical tools, but all the people I wanted to study all those questions with which she'd come with to economics had disappeared from the scene. So what we're trying to do in the project I'm going to talk about is to uh, find a way of, of making the, the, the chair in the department in Turkey less depressed and uh, keeping the faith, uh, not disappointing people like Natalie. So the, the project that's already been mentioned by Perry and Oscar is called the, the core project, and core has two meanings. The, the, the words, the, it's an acronym for curriculum, open access, resources in economics. And why it's called core is because in this project, this particular project, what we're going for is the core of the economics curriculum. The sense in which the discipline of economics is defined by what students get in their introduction to economics course and in the intermediate courses in, in typically divided into micro and macroeconomics. So, so this is about the core. And where I want to begin is with three gaps in economics teaching. The first one is between what, what we know and what we teach undergraduates, so what we know as, as, as economists, what we teach. The second one is between those questions that uh, that we've been pressed to answer. We've been pressed to answer the really big important questions uh, by the public, but also by our students. And there just seems to be a, a great divide between uh, the significance, the salience of those questions and what we, we turn out in the economics classroom. 
And the third gap is between the conventional way we teach as, as economic lectur e economics lecturers, where we stand up in front of a big, in, in a big hall, a bit like this, and we have a series of slides, and we click, click, click through the slides, and the students sit in the audience doing nothing. I mean, it, in, in the olden days, they used to actually write something. Now they don't, they don't do anything. They just sit there. So we want to uh, uh, really close this gap between that conventional method of teaching and what's now available using new, new technology and interactive learning methods. So I'm going to start with the third gap and argue that what we're trying to do is to produce a new way of learning economics and to explain to you what the, what the core project is doing. This is a very young project. We just started in the autumn of last year. And what our aim is, is to produce a new first course in economics for undergraduate students. We're not going to produce a book, but an online resource. And this is going to be fully interactive. So there, there'll be test your understanding questions. The students will have online help for, for concepts and maths. We have a button called an Einstein that you can press when you get stuck with understanding uh, some of the maths. Uh, the online method methodology allows us to teach uh, model, model building in economics using diagrams in a way that I think is far more effective than in the traditional classroom. We'll have simulations and games. And one of the features of the course that we're developing is a series of videos. Um, and I'm kind of looking around to see who I can re recruit to star in our, in our series of Economists in Action. Because what we're trying to do there is to, is to convey to undergraduate students uh, how exciting it is to be an economist, the kind of research and policy work that economists get involved in, and, in, and to tie very directly the, the Economist in Action in the particular unit to what the students are studying. And I'll, I'll give, show you an example. So this is how the course begins. This is unit one. This is the first taste of economics for an undergraduate student with, with what we call the capitalist revolution. And you can see that the format here is of an e-book in the Inkling platform. So cross-platform, you'll be able to, to uh, look at it on your, your phone or your tablet as well as a PC. And I'll just wander through this, this first unit, a little piece of it, so that you can see uh, what it looks like. This is one of the images uh, the, of long-run economic development. We provide definitions that students can, so that they can go back when they feel like it to really understand the concepts that we're using. There's a big emphasis, even in the first unit, on inequality. Uh, we explain very intuitively the Gini coefficient. They can highlight this, add it to their notes, and then they'll see that Understanding the Gini co coefficient is more or less as easy as uh, cutting up a piece of pie. And then they see the pie. And they'll see that the genie and two genies in the middle span the distance from Denmark to South Africa in the data that they'll be working with. This is episode one of the Economist in Action series, where we have Suresh Naidu from Columbia University. And he's going to be, uh, what, what he talks about in the video, I'm not going to show it to you now, but what, what he does is he picks up this long data series of real wages of craftsmen in London, and he connects it uh, very closely to institutional developments in the economy. And he's, we can pick up here, he shows that all the way from 1351 to 1875 until the Master and Servant Act was abolished and trade unions could be organized and that was so much a part of sustaining those increases in real wages that you see in the chart. The step-by-step -step model building, I'll just give you another example here. With this long hockey stick of history, which is a, a theme, a visual theme from the first unit, starting from the year 1000, we focus the attention of students on how did the world come to look like it is today? Well, something very important happened at this kind of upward tick in the hockey stick. And in unit two, we, uh, the, the first model that they, that, they, that they come across is answering this question of why, why was the spinning jenny introduced? Why did the Industrial Revolution take place in, in England? 
and we work them through a model, which I won't, uh, it's too early in the morning to go through the detail of this, but just to highlight that from very early in the course, we introduce Schumpeterian rents and a very dynamic view of how to understand economic development situated in, this, uh, in the context of these giant questions of economic development. Episode two is Bob Allen, so not all economists in action have to be cool. Um, <laughs> Bob provides a, a very rich answer to the question of why England and why in the 18th century. But let's move on. Unit three is where we start the, the basic model, modeling of individual decision making. That's all you're going to get at the moment. Uh, I, I've got a very limited time to, to work through the material. But let me come back, step back a bit from what we're actually producing to uh, situate our response to the challenges to the curriculum within a broader context. So I think there are three different responses to the dissatisfaction coming from, from the public, coming from students, and coming from teachers about what's currently taught. One response to that is just to have better, more engaging examples, but basically stick to the current stuff that's taught. And you can think of this as the free economics style response. The second response is a very different one, and that's a response that says the way we should introduce students to economics is through a diversity of schools of, of thought, and it could be uh, presented sometimes as a kind of uh, paradigm tournament. And this, uh, this is very... This approach is, is very uh, highly debated. There was a whole page article in Le Monde last week with this wonderful cartoon. Um, uh, and, and this is certainly one direction in which curriculum reform is moving. But what we're doing is, is different. And I think it's quite interesting to set the project that, that I'm engaged in against those two other uh, uh, alternatives. What we're trying to do is to narrow the gap in what we teach to undergraduates between what we know and what they get and between the important questions that they come with and what we teach. So how does what we're doing in the core curriculum differ? It's question rather than tool motivated. So instead of uh, the focus being on, well, you have to learn all these tools, first of all, and eventually we might introduce you to some interesting applications, and in the meantime, we'll introduce you to trivial applications. We start the other way around. We start with the big questions, and we teach the tools that are necessary. The approach is deeply empirically uh, motivated and oriented, and I think uh, you will have seen that from the, the examples that I gave already. Michael Sandel last night talked about uh, the way that markets can crowd out morals in, in, uh, in economics. We introduced these ideas in the fourth unit, the fourth unit of 20, where the 20 units can be taught in one or two semesters. So very early on, we're introducing students to uh, a, a very different way of thinking about the economy in which they come to see from an evaluative perspective that, that they both have to think about efficiency and to think about fairness. And we can do this in an intro to economics course. Another example I've put up here is that we, we introduce instability and bubbles. It, it's threaded through the course that we develop in unit nine. We explain how prices can convey incorrect information. We talk about beliefs and why instability develops. In unit 12, we talk about how bubbles can amplify fluctuations in the economy as a whole. And then in Unit 15, we have this historical focus where we talk about the Great Depression, the Golden Age, and the global financial crisis. And they've already got the analytical tools to match with the economic history that, uh, that gives them this rich understanding of the, last, uh, of the last century. It's pretty clear that we're not teaching a model which, which is basically one of a unique equilibrium. Once you have multiple equilibria, then it's obvious that you have to be interested in history and dynamics and in instability. We place a great deal of attention on uh, institutional facts. As I said, we're talking not only about the mutual gains that arise in a particular economic interaction, but also about the conflict of interest over their distribution. Efficiency and fairness are central to what we're going to be teaching. 
and we uh, embed the economy um, in, in nature and in society in a way that many introduction to economics courses uh, fail to do. So that's what we're doing. The question is, how are we constructing this? Um, well, we have a team of about 25 academics from all different places around the world who are volunteering their time to produce uh, the new course material. We're working closely with designers and web developers in Bangalore. And we have engagement from students, from teachers, but also this pressure coming from employers, both in the private and public sector, that we should be teaching our students better. The, the, the course material is going to be in beta testing um, at University College London, so my feet will be in the fire, um, at UMass Boston and at Warwick this September. Um, early next year, we'll, we'll be teaching it in Sciences Po, in Paris, in Sydney University, the University of Chile, if we've got our Spanish translation organized by then, and in Azim Premji in Bangalore. These are the people who are working on the project. There are people here from a wide variety of places in the world, people with research specializations across the whole of economics and economic history, and all of these people are deeply interested in pedagogy, in, in trying to get what they know about economics into the undergraduate curriculum. So this is now the guessing game. The, qu the question is, what are these pictures here? I think if I, if I actually went around the room, it wouldn't take you very long to, to come up with the answer. So the first word cloud is the word cloud for the whole of, uh, principles of uh, Mancuse principles of economics. And the second word cloud is of just the first unit of our core economics intro to economics. But, and what we're doing is as we produce each of these units, we're producing a word cloud. And what's going to be really fascinating is once we've got the whole of our 20 units, how different our word cloud looks from the, from the Mancu word cloud. I encourage you to look at our website, the Corecon website, where you'll find more information and you can get involved um, uh, in the project as well. Uh, the tanker has been turned before. The question is, what does it take? It takes the fact that there are really big questions, very important questions for the world uh, out there that economics has to address. We've got a great deal of new research that's, very, that's making a constructive contribution to answering those questions. And the question is, how do we bring all of that into the classroom to our, to our students? And to do that, we need to have a way of communicating with students. And what we're doing in this project is making a step in that direction by producing the ebook material for an introduction to economics course. Thank you. Um, <coughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, John Smithin, and I'm a professor of economics in both the Department of Economics um, and the Schulich School of Business at York University here in Toronto. I guess the Schulich School occupies a somewhat similar position in our country um, to th that which Oscar was de uh, describing. So I empathize, although our students, I have to say, are by no means <laughs> as, uh, as rebellious. Now, uh, Last night, I was uh, you know, looking desperately for w the websites which um, Michael Sandel talked about, you know, the ones that would provide a talk for you <laughs> for $149, and they seem to all have gone out of business uh, since last night. Um, so I'll actually start then by referring back to the dinner uh, talk of the, um, of the previous evening with uh, John Rolson Stahl, and he argued the point, or made the point, that the financial crisis of 2008 and the subsequent worldwide economic depression and the continuing dislocation to this day have made little or no uh, impression on the way that macroeconomics specifically is taught at the university level. 
from Economics 101 through uh, graduate school. It has been business as usual, which seems to me to mean an almost studious avoidance of any attempt to acquire knowledge of how monetary economies actually work. Now, um, Perry talked about the report that he and Robert Skidowski uh, made it's two or three years ago, was it? Two, two years ago, the portrait that he made two years ago. And I, I'm, I'm turning to the other, the other side of that report, the, the graduate instruction, specifically graduate um, instruction in macroeconomics. And one of Skidowski's uh, proposals was to remove the responsibility for graduate instruction in macroeconomics specifically from economics departments altogether. Excuse me. And to locate them in uh, some other academic unit, such as history, philosophy, sociology, political science, or elsewhere. But I don't think that, that solution would work because if we're accepting, and I think we are, that there are issues with the way that economics is, economics is taught in academia, the same actually is true of all the other dis disciplines as well. They all have their own biases and hang-ups and so on, driven by academic politics as much as by scholarly inquiry. Now, I would actually prefer to see a dedicated 18-month program at the graduate level, such as, and let me there's too much alliteration, such as a Master of Monetary Macroeconomics or a Master of Macroeconomic Policy, actually on the model of current Masters of Business Administration or MBA programs. Um, now, uh, David says that's a dream, uh, but um, don't forget we've already resolved to abolish the business schools. This was another um, uh, 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 point of... Um, uh, uh, John Rolson Saul's uh, talk um, on, um, uh, on the first evening. So we're, we're going to have all the buildings at least. <laughs> and I'm sorry, ask it, it affects me as much as it affects you. <laughs> um, so, uh, but yes, I, I would like to see a, uh, um, something dedicated at the graduate level, 18 month program to monetary macroeconomics. Now, in the MBA programs that we do have, um, business administration as such is the main object of the exercise. And the other courses, the other courses that you do, such as accounting, finance, marketing, and so on, are definitely in the mode of service courses. In a similar way, I would say that the curriculum of the proposed um, MME or MMP should be driven by bona fide macroeconomists, who, if they are bona fide, will indeed be philosophically, philosophically, historically, and politically informed, but whose main interest is in the field itself. Additional courses in economics, sociology, history, philosophy, and so on, could be prominent in the curriculum, but would be recognizably service courses on the model of the MBA and uh, other uh, professional uh, degrees. So, I think the next thing we should say, though, is why is it the case that mainstream macroeconomics, as I shall call it, is in such a state that serious uh, writers, such as Gadowski, and serious speakers, uh, um, such as many of the speakers we've heard in this conference, um, such as uh, John Rolson saw, suggest that it should be done away with altogether. So in the rest of the, of the talk, I will identify a number of methodological problems uh, that do beset the subject as currently practiced and suggest ways in which the problems might be resolved. Uh, I will argue that the same solutions would benefit equally uh, teaching and research and ultimately, and that's the ultimate goal, uh, public policy uh, itself. Now I have to work out how to use the clicker. Ah, there we are. So these are the methodological problems in mainstream macroeconomics. The first one, you know, is fairly obvious. I mean, the fundamental pr uh, premise of neoclassical microeconomics is that it is, at its base, economic activity boils down to just uh, barter exchange. And it's obvious that things like money and credit, macroeconomic issues in general, uh, take a back seat. Um, Dudley Dillard, 25 years ago, called this the barter illusion. 
Um, the second problem is the virtual identification of the term economic theory with differential and stochastic calculus used to solve the optimization problems of the mythical representative agent. John King um, called that the microfoundation micro foundations delusion. Um, and I wrote this, um, I'll just quote on the jacket copy for John's book. I say, the illusion has been with us for a very long time, whereas the delusion is of more recent vintage. Together, they have blocked mainstream macroeconomics from achieving a basic understanding of monetary and macroeconomic phenomena at a time when this is most urgently needed. Um, we can go on. Um, the uh, um, the uh, number three is the use of statistical probability theory as the main empirical method in um, econometrics under the name of econometrics. Um, strictly speaking, and we've heard this in um, other talks in the program as well, the theorems of statistical probability theory do not apply in the social world. And here I tend to agree with Paul Davidson that uh, one should go back uh, to Keynes, um, you know, as opposed to Knight. I mean, this was a point that Keynes made uh, very early on in the Treatise on Probability in 1921, and of course in the famous Quarterly Journal of Economics uh, article on 1937. On this idea that there's a different ontology to the social world and the natural world, I think an excellent book on this is by the philosopher John Searle, Making the Social World. And um, also um, on that, you could read uh, my 2013A, which I have to remember what that is. Ah, yes, that is the requirements of a philosophy of money and finance, that, 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 uh, that, that, that uh, book by me. Uh, the fourth problem. Um, as has been found, uh, you know, throughout um, the attempt, uh, uh, throughout attempts to discuss political economy, we, there has never been any valid or coherent attempt at deriving so-called capital theory. It seems to be a problem which admits of, of no solution. So uh, the fourth problem is the incoherence, really, uh, not, not just of neoclassical theory, but really any and all attempts at deriving a capital theory. Um, you know, obviously I can do no better than refer to Jeff Harcourt's classic summary of the issues in the Journal of Economic Literature back in 1969. Um, you know, that was the end of the capital theory debate of the 1960s. What happened to the capital theory debate? Uh, oh, well, um, you know, Cambridge UK won, but let's forget that and move on <laughs> uh, with the program. Now, we need to pause at this point, okay, uh, to ask um, just what is left. Excuse me, I'm suffering a bit from a, suffering a, bit from a cold. Um, we need, need to pause at this point to ask, well then, just what is left of the program of the mainstream school? And I suppose that an honest intellectual answer would be, not very much. But you know, this can be a tough sell. Um, you know, Perry was referring to it, and this was a David's phrase, I think, who's gonna teach this stuff? I mean, it can be a tough sell, in particular, to the people who've already invested the time and energy in learning uh, the various techniques. Um, and by the way, that includes myself, but of course it includes someone that's you know, spent time in graduate school already um, learning all of this stuff. So, um, I've tried to, um, uh, the wording of my uh, comments, I, I, I've tried to make, I think the wording makes enough caveats to cover the potential objections. The criticism is of ec econometrics as the main empirical method, the virtual identification of economic theory, differential calculus and so on. Um, you know, for example, if one goes on to suggest, as I will do, um, you know, numerical methods as one way forward, um, it's obvious that a, a possible source of trial values or starting values for, for parameters would be econometric exercises. But again, the word exercise, uh, you know, is significant. And also the word trial would be significant there. Uh, of course, 
Also, there's the opposite danger, though, um, which I try not to do, of making so many caveats that you just return to the status quo, and that's, that, that's, that's another danger. So what is the correct methodology for, oh, it's not moving. What is the correct methodology for monetary macroeconomics? Um, and I would say, number one, use explicitly macroeconomic methods. And I'll just say that the nature of money both necessitates um, such an approach, and if it necessitates such approach, of course, it more than justifies it. And, uh, number two, restrict attention to relatively small models of both the closed and the open economy. The closed for theoretical purposes, the open for you know, you know, real-world uh, policy um, purposes. And all I mean by that, that, that they should be relatively small, is that even if we do use technological tools, there should be no, quote, black boxes. Um, the, the structure of the model should be um, um, clear both to those who are constructing the model and those who are potentially uh, using it. Then this number three is extremely important, of course, and uh, uh, which is to take seriously uh, the notions of endogenous money and bank uh, credit creation. I would say that this is one of the main collective contributions. I, I put the stress on collective because there are, of course, claims to academic priority always you know, in academia. Uh, so, so I think this is one of the main collective contributions of the various uh, heterodox schools of monetary economics, post-Keynesian theory in both its structuralist and horizontalist wings, circuit theory, MMT, which is called uh, modern money theory, um, and others. And then finally, um, which is actually a quote from Keynes, and with one interpol interpolation from myself, to make use of only two fundamental units of quantity, namely quantities of real money value and quantities of employment. And that's, uh, that obviously, the purpose of that, and Keynes was aware of it, is to avoid the quagmire of, um, of capital theory. So, you know, is there a better way forward? Well, we've seen some, some examples of better ways forward um, already today um, in this talk. As far as the macroeconomics is concerned, in my uh, money enterprise and income distribution, I did argue that one way forward um, is simply to take a step back and to return to the practices, practice of monetary macroeconomics in the style of writers such as Keynes. The later Hicks, I do stress the later Hicks um, and the post-Keynesians. Uh, but having said that, um, uh, does this mean that there is nothing that the methods and technology of the 21st century can add? We have a conference on, on innovation. Of course not. There is something that the 21st century can add. And this is where the ideas of computers come in. So I'm going to argue, um, then, that one possible way forward um, uh, are, and this is a mouthful, I always, um, non-stochastic uh, computer simulation methods or numerical methods in discrete time. Um, uh, um, and I, I think that that, you know, obviously, that uses computers. I believe that that can provide, first, a, theor a theoretical method that can handle fundamental uncertainty. No, I mean, it handles it in a way simply by um, adding parameters, for example, to uh, uh, describe the state of liquidity preference or the level of animal spirits, that sort of thing. And of course, uh, um, also that discussion, uh, the discussion earlier today of reflexivity um, in the social and economic world is highly relevant here as to how we can, we can uh, use that. And it provides an empirical method based firmly on the pr principle of abduction. Uh, um, that's not what it means, that's a philosophical term, um, rather than uh, induction. Um, essentially, um, Matthias Griselli said this the other day, what the process of abduction is, is something like you know, looking at past historical data and preparing a court case. You know, there are many possible lines of inquiry and you build, up, um, you build up a weight of evidence, shall we say, which eventually brings you to uh, the right conclusion. So this, these methods do uh, enable you to use the 
principle of abduction uh, as an empirical method rather than induction. And so my, the final references I put there, I mean, Tony Lawson, of course, in his economic reality, uh, talks extensively um, uh, about uh, abduction uh, rather than induction as an empirical method. I, I must refer to the path-breaking book by Wynne Godley and Marc Lavoie. Marc Lavoie is also here at this conference on monetary economics, which is an exemplar, shall we say, of the kind of things that I mean. If, uh, if uh, you look at the two references to myself, Smith in 1982 and Smith in 2013b, uh, you can see what the difference is there. In 1982, we didn't really have the computer technology to do uh, these methods. Uh, 30 years later, um, it's there. And so why not use them? Thank you very much. I should do a time check because we did start late. Our speakers have been very responsible about staying to their time. And in order to get our last speaker in, I need somebody to tell me how much time we have left. There's a board there that says we have four minutes. Can we go over that a little bit? Does anybody have the authority to say so? Well, I want four minutes. Well, OK. Or I think you ought to have 10 if you, that's, if you that's want fine. it. I knew I was coming last, so I have no slides, um, because I knew I wouldn't have a chance to get them at them. You know, I had full rational expectations. Um, oh, <laughs> now, uh, now I have more time than what I needed. But I'm trying to sort of be very s short um, and, and really just have seven points that I want to make, you know, sort of bring in. <clears throat> the first is that education is important. It's the ep replicator dynamics of the economics profession. And it really is, you know, sort of the most important thing that we have to look at. So the fact <clears throat> that, you know, we have INET looking at it, I think is really important. Um, the second is that the existing system is robust. You know, sort of, it's really, really complicated. And the thought that to build a better course or to build a better way of looking at something will lead people to come to it is not the way it works. You know, sort of what one does is have to figure out, here's the institutional structure of the system, and how have the change that one has with the institutional structure is going to be able to sort of integrate with that. And that is not, for the most part, radical changes unless you get a revolution like in Chile or something. It, it's very much changes at the edges, figuring out, here's a niche where I can make a change. Here's where it's possible. So it, it's really, really difficult. Within that, there is no crisis in economics. Let me repeat that. There is no crisis in economics. I just came from a humanities conference, you know, so where there were English and history professors. And they were really worried about, are we going to be able to get people in our courses? What are we going to do? Can we get any jobs for our graduates? That was the discussion. In economics, that isn't the discussion. You can get jobs for graduates. And the enrollments in economics are going up substantially. Yes, there's lots of complaints by students that there's problems in economics, but there's complaints all the time. The complaints translated into here's a demand for change that precedence here isn't there. The presidents I talk to feel the biggest you know, problems are with the humanities. You know, how are we going to keep sort of the demand up for that, not with economics? Um, the third point I wanted to make is publishers are providing what the market wants. Let me repeat that. Publishers are providing what they want, what the market wants. Publishers don't care about what they sell. It's, publishers sort of view it as selling soap. Tell us what you want and we will do it. So it isn't as if here publishers aren't looking and trying to figure out. It's very much, you know, here is what they hear that the market wants and they provide it in their text. <clears throat> now, I went to change economics probably 30 years ago. I wrote a principles book that I thought would be different. I said, here, I have all these wonderful ideas. The publisher said, great, great, we're really interested. Then they bring them to the focus groups, and guess what? Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, and, and everything else. And by the time my book got published, of course, it was much more consistent with the existing text. And that was because that is what the market wanted, that is what the publishers could sell. Um, I'm now in the 10th edition, 
Um, so I've kept that up. But there's a continual fight between me and the publishers. I want to do new things. They said, don't do new things. You'll, you'll hurt your sales. Um, and oh, if you do this, this is going to cost you $50,000. This is going to cost you $20,000. So every time you're adding it, but it isn't the money. It's the loss of sort of the people who will do it. So I put a section on modern economics saying, look, modern economics, it's about statistics now. And really, you know, changed. In the next edition, that chapter is moving back. And the reason for that is while the reviewers said they wanted it, actually, you know, when we looked who used it, very, very few people used it because they would have had to change their notes more than what could, could have been done. <laughs> Fourth is that reviewers, when they give you sort of the reviews on your books, don't tell the truth. They say, here, we'd really like this. But in actual fact, what happens is, here, when you look at sales and what's operating there, <clears throat> sort of they want less change as possible. So you have you know, a variety of books that change little, and that's because that's what the market wants. Um, the fifth is that things are changing. And it's because of techno <coughs> technology. Technology is undermining the publishing world and the publisher's model of the old times. They don't think of themselves as doing books anymore. <coughs> in my preface, I was not allowed to write, in this book, I'm doing something. My book has now become a product. And it's a product because they are thinking, here's where our revenue stream is going to come from. And it isn't coming from the sale of books. It's coming from the online preparatory learning systems that they're developing around books. And so that <laughs> leaves a change, which is very much the change we're getting here, you know, with the online stuff. But the publishers are very much doing that too, except they're trying to get a proprietary aspect into it. <clears throat> and so my book is, is McGraw-Hill, and so they have the Learn Smart system, where they're spending lots and lots of money to try and you know, sort of do that, to make it easier in the online learning. So there's been an enormous change in the royalty statement. I used to get royalty statements, so there's three variations of the book. And it was about 12 pages long. Now it's about 130 pages long. And it's 130 pages long because there are so many variations of the way it's used. Online versions, you know, this chapter, this ch chapter there. <clears throat> That's a fundamental change <clears throat> in the way it's going. Um, so I think what you're seeing there is that the publishers are changing and they are becoming, in a sense, they don't see their future as publishing books. They see their future <coughs> as essentially replacing colleges in some ways, providing online educational systems that they can sell where they will be able to collect their rents from that. And I think that's the situation in which you have to look at that. So what does this all mean for INET? Um, first, you know, sort of it means the way they're going, I think, is really along the lines of the way the system is going. But they're going to have competition in that, and competition is going to be very <coughs> serious. And the competition is money here we'll be getting, you know, sort of <coughs> from selling that system, and they're going to be continually putting it in. So it isn't a one time, here I create something. It has to be an ongoing effort that continues because probably about 20% is the online material <coughs> that's associated with it, and, that, and that's what they're selling. So I you know, want to end very quickly here. So at the end of in the graduate movie, if any of you remember that, there was a statement, you know, what to remember. And you know, so the guy said, plastics. What I want to say is certification. Let me repeat that. Certification is the new key for what we're talking about. So we're having all this new mo mokes, new ways of delivering things. So that's all fine and everything. You can do it. But who is going to certify that that's a course? Who is going to certify that that some knows something? It's that connection that really is, I think, the key. Because who gets to certify? is who has power and control as to way the, the way the change can make. Now, in order to get that, I think you, know, you need some long-term thing. I just had a few suggestions you know, in terms of what I think the book should be. First, I'm a strong advocate of for benefit as opposed to for profit or not for profit. And for benefit are where people are doing it on their own because they want to do it, but they get enough money coming in 
to keep the project sustainable. So the sustainability cannot come from outside. It has to be internal to the system. So I think that hasn't been thought about yet, how we can you know, really keep this going, because a lot is not, here I create the initial project. It's here I change it. The next, it has to be a world book, not a US-centric book. The real problem with the text is they're all US-centric. They have to be written from the world perspective and, and coming around. So I agree very much with Oscar. I think you need an authoritative book to sort of enter in. If we just have here's another book, that will be problematic. But if, on the other hand, you have here's a group of authorities that can do it, if you can get 10 people who will put their name on and say, this, I believe, is what we should be teaching, that will make a bigger difference. And finally, it should be a course book, not a textbook. So I'll end there. Thank you. I don't think we have time for comments is it, uh, or questions, no. Sorry about that, uh, but many thanks to our excellent presenters. <laughs>